All right. What's hey, up? Everybody. What's up? Hey, how's it going, everybody? I mean, you look like you don't need any introduction because you're ready. Everyone is just watching you. So why don't you take it over? Cool. But right, big thanks. round of applause for him, though. <laughs> oh, look at him. He's blushing. <laughs> All right. Let me, give me one second. Let me share my screen. All right. There we go. Great. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So, hey, everybody. I'm EG with Infura. Um, really awesome uh, that GoalieCon's going on. I wish I could be there in person. But um, actually, uh -oh. yeah. So um, today I wanted to uh, talk to you guys a bit about dev P2P monitoring. I'm really excited about GoalieCon. Really excited that this is going on. Um, a quick word about uh, obviously, I, I work for Infura. I'm one of the co-founders of Infura. And uh, when I first found out about GoalieCon at ETH Berlin, I, I thought it was a fantastic project and I, I wanted to be involved. So first of all, thank you to everybody that uh, created Gorly and is involved in pushing it forward. I think one of the things that we've found uh, over the last few months is the value of test nets. So knowing that with the Constantinople fork and the issues that we had on the testnet on Rothstein, we saw the value of a cross-client testnet, and we saw the value that developers uh, needed with having a stable environment in which to test their applications, and how that's also distinct from the test environment where protocol developers need to be able to test consensus changes. So I'm really excited about the Gorley initiative, and uh, really happy to be presenting today. So uh, today I wanted to talk a bit about our dev P2P network. There's there's so much uh, attention that's paid in our space to, you know, the, the economic incentives and layer two scaling and the stuff that's going on with ETH 2.0 that we really take for granted what, um, what I like to consider layer zero uh, of all of this, and that's the dev P2P layer. Um, the blockchains are, are distributed networks and peer-to-peer -peer networks. And so it, it really deserves a little bit more attention. Um, so today I want to talk about the current state of our dev P2P network and a tool that um, I developed uh, in my spare time that I, I'm open sourcing today uh, to help people uh, understand the insights that, that I've found over the last couple of uh, months playing around with this. So let's start with a quick recap of dev P2P for anybody that's not familiar. It's the peer-to-peer -peer layer that allows all of our Ethereum nodes to connect without there being a central point of failure. Um, it's a distributed hash table, Kademlia-based Kedem routing table. Uh, so th this is pretty much the way that you know most peer uh, current peer-to-peer -peer networks work for discovering uh, other peers to connect to and sharing information. And it's UDP-based, which uh, will um, be relevant a little bit later in my talk. And uh, But it's not just UDP. Uh, the dev P2P protocol is a mix of both UDP and TCP. So to connect to the network, you need to connect to a boot node. Uh, these boot nodes are hard-coded into the client implementations. So if you go look in the source code of Parity, of Geth, of Pantheon, of any of the other clients that are out there, um, you're, you're going to find a, a hard-coded list. And this hard-coded list is the list that initially was maintained by the foundation. And um, later on, other people started to add some nodes to this list of these known points from which you can discover other peers on the network. You don't need to use these nodes as long as you know a node that's on this network, you can connect to that one and start the peer discovery. The, the nearby peers to connect to message is the thing that's going to give you additional peers to, to um, try to get information from. So in dev P2P, that's the find neighbors message. And, and that's something that I, I ended up using a lot for basically crawling this network and trying to understand the health of the peers that are out there. Discovery is distinct from the ETH sub-protocol. So that's what I was talking about earlier with the UDP part of the protocol and the TCP part of the protocol. UDP is only used for discovery. So 
that's the Kademlia based discovery. His ping pong, like we bond our connection together after that. And then we're allowed to ask each other about our, our different peers that we're aware of. That's all UDP based. And then as soon as you discover this peering list, you switch over to a TCP based protocol, which is actually the Ethereum sub protocol. That's the way that you sync information from nodes, the way that you transfer information about transactions and the way that you uh, propagate block information. So if we're talking about what we currently know about the network, um, the, the things that come up pretty often are how many nodes are there on the network? That's generally been seen as a metric for the health of a peer-to-peer uh, -peer network is how large is it? So typically our network has ranged anywhere from you know, a few thousand, 5,000, 8,000, all the way up to over 30,000 uh, last year. Uh, right now, I think we're sitting around somewhere in the 10,000 range. Uh, how many of them are running a specific version of a client? So uh, before people were just curious about how many people were running Geth versus Parity, were people still running Ethereum J? Um, and, uh, and then it became uh, more recently, what versions are people running? Uh, AFRI put out a great tool earlier to see how many people were connected to the, uh, or how many people were updated in time for the fork. Um, or the uh, attempted for. Uh, how many people are uh, using light clients and how many light client servers are out there? Um, one of the things that I discovered recently is that um, there's uh, it, it's, it's still difficult to get certain light client implementations connected because they, there aren't enough peers that are serving light client data. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit more later. So one of the reasons that we should care is that this is, this is something that could potentially help us discover attack vectors such as Eclipse attacks. If you're not familiar with the Eclipse attack that was reported, uh, actually, I think it was a couple of years ago now, um, it, it was a way of basically surrounding uh, a peer with malicious peers and, uh, and feeding it false information. Uh, in, in a way uh, to uh, eclipse it from, from the rest of the network and, and give it its own view or malicious view of information. Um, knowing the, the size of, of the network and the number of peers can, can potentially help discover things like this. Uh, denial of service mitigation. So recently another attack vector was discovered where um, it wasn't a direct attack vector, it was more a vulnerability where the UDP-based protocol could be used uh, to create a, uh, um, an IP spoofing attack. So I, I can craft a, a UDP packet that says, give me all of your you know, peer information, and this is my IP address. And instead, it's an IP address of you know, a, a cryptocurrency exchange or something like that. And, in, and now I've weaponized the peer-to-peer -peer network to deliver tons of data um, to uh, a target of my choosing, right? So the having a collection of this peer-to-peer -peer data will allow us to see, okay, what version of the client was uh, found that was vulnerable to this? How many of them are still running, right? So that we can get an idea of the severity of a specific uh, vulnerability that's reported. <coughs> Excuse me. So the current view into the network is uh, primarily Ethernodes. Ethernodes has been a great service that, that's been running uh, longer than I've been part of the ecosystem over three years. And um, it, it's been the way that you could quickly get a glimpse of, you know, what's the client breakdown, the client versions, the operating systems. Um, I, I wanted to try to run one myself and um, maybe I just didn't know the right place to look, but I couldn't find the source code for, for Ethernodes. And so I said, well, let's, uh, let's try writing one myself. So, so I started out trying to build a dev P2P indexer. Um, I decided to build it on top of Ethereum JS dev P2P, um, trying to look at the implementations of the dev P2P protocol across Python, Golang, Rust, uh, a few other ones. This seemed like the, the easiest one to take and hack on pretty quickly um, just because of the modularity of you know, node modules and uh, JavaScript. So took this and started building on top of it. And the first thing I, I needed to know was how do I discover these nodes? 
Um, I start with the boot nodes and then I'm going to get some peers and then what? So um, I, I decided, okay, let, let's start with that. We're going to write a simple client to, as these new peers come in, I'm going to ask them for their peers and, and, and then just use traditional uh, distributed hash table crawling techniques. And so that's, you randomize your find neighbor lookups. So the way that the lookup calls work is that um, you basically give it an address and uh, you're going to be looking for peers within a range of this address. Um, the the specifics, of that, specifics of that is uh, an XOR of the enode address. So your, your public, key, public key that represents the address of your Ethereum node um, it is basically the, the start of where you're going to try to discover neighbors. And if you randomize that when you uh, hit these peers, you're going to get different lists of information. And then, and then you can wait. Um, that's pretty much the way that you have to go with a peer-to-peer -peer network. There's, um, there's only so much that you can do. And if I run this crawler, if you run this crawler, if 10 different people run this crawler, uh, we're all going to get 10 slightly different um, views on the network. And that's just uh, how this distributed system works. But um, getting as much information as possible will give us a better idea uh, of the whole picture. So uh, once we send out these messages, we discover these peers, we ask them for their health information. This is part of the Ethereum sub protocol is when they first report back in, they say, these are the capabilities I support. This is my client, you know, basic information. But then the, what I really wanted to know, what, why I started this was uh, working on Infura. There's a lot of misinformation out there that, that we come across on Twitter of Infura runs all the nodes on the Ethereum network, which I definitely know is not true. Um, we were the only ones that can keep nodes in sync that most of us here know is not true. And uh, I, I always resisted the urge to respond to these things because they're coming from trolls where if I just respond, I have no way of backing up, you know, what I say without actual information. And the, this isn't information that's on chain. It's not verifiable unless you can verify it yourself by running it. And so, so that's what I started out with this is, all right, let's, let's, uh, let's create a tool where other people can verify the, the size of the network and the health of the network. And so, in addition to trying to find the number of peers, I was trying to find, are they healthy? And if they're healthy, are they, uh, are they mostly light clients? Are they full nodes? You're not able to see things like, are they archive nodes? That's something that's outside the space of the peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol. But knowing whether or not they're, they're full nodes, I think is sufficient. So as this data came in, I decided to throw it into a document store. I, I initially started with Postgres and then moved it into Mongo, or sorry, Mongo, and then moved it into Postgres instead. <coughs> uh, I needed to enrich the data because I wanted to create visualizations, um, something that was better than the simple views that Ether scan, sorry, um, Ether nodes was uh, had, which was the basic pie charts. Like we we have all of this data, we should be able to see, you know, what's the number of healthy nodes over time over the last year. What's the number of nodes that are keeping in sync if, say, you know, God forbid there's another uh, spam attack or something on the network and nodes are struggling to stay in sync, what's the effect that that has? And so um, one of the pieces of key pieces of information that you need there is the block number. In the Ethereum sub protocol, what you get back is uh, their best hash. So this is like the, the best hash that I'm aware of. And for you to be able to determine what number that is, you need to look up that actual block information. The dev P2P client that I built this on top of was not um, a full client. It was just like a very thin dev P2P client. And so I ended up querying uh, my local node that was running to be able to say, give me this block number, and then I would index that as well. So that's what I'm talking about with enriching the data. Additionally, it was also the GOIP information so that we could see what's the, the client distribution across the globe. Like, are, are most of them running in Amazon data centers? Are we pretty evenly distributed? Um, the block numbers like I discussed. And then since we're storing this in a document store with the intent of visualizing it, wanted to make sure that we were indexing on pertinent fields 
so that we can quickly query this information. We're going to have a lot of information in here, um, you know, hundreds of documents per day, potentially, if we're querying a specific node for their health every couple of hours and then um, indexing it, wanted to make sure we can query on, like, give me all of the nodes around this block number, give me all the nodes that, um, oh, actually, an, an interesting thing that I was thinking about was, are people cycling their e notes? You know, like are people concerned about their privacy and saying, you know, I'm I'm running a cryptocurrency exchange. I don't want somebody to be, you know, detecting where my trans where transactions are originating from if they can glean that. If the network's small enough, you potentially could. So maybe they're cycling addresses. Maybe they're cycling um, uh, e notes. And so um that that was something else and and the uh the last thing that i thought was valuable was capturing the capabilities of a node so how many of them are uh supporting light clients or enabling whisper enabling uh, swarm uh, all, all of these things are, are captured there and not exposed currently in any of the uh um, sources of sources of information that we have like uh like ether nodes so all of this is, uh, it's very useful to understand the historical state of the network. And besides that, I'm, I'm a little bit sentimental about this in, in thinking um, it's, it's great and surreal to see the growth of our ecosystem over time, that this information is not stored on chain. We talk about the blockchain being immutable and this um, you know, information being stored for posterity, but part that's only... The on-chain information is only part of this story, and the peer-to-peer -peer network is another part. And it's really cool to capture the historical state of this information. My ideal would be that you know maybe the foundation runs something like this and and captures this historical information, so that um, you know ten years from now, if people wanted to know the health of our peer-to-peer -peer network now, there that information is available. Track once we start tracking this historical information, you realize that tracking node health over time. Is, um, is almost like tracking node reputation. And could current client implementations use this data to improve their ability to prune bad nodes from, from the, the peering table? So um, oftentimes in the past, I've run into issues where my node would just stop syncing data. And when I would look at it, I would you know SSH in, take a look at the uh, console and find that a lot of the peers that I were peered with were not in sync. And so I was stuck in this area of, you know, having to manually kick off peers so that it would hopefully find healthy peers for me to sync from. Um, those issues have slowly gotten resolved, but I'm sure that there's room for optimization. And I'm hoping that this information can help client developers take a closer look at that. So <clears throat> now let me take you through the code because it's pretty, pretty quick. Uh, all right, so like I was saying, the uh, the code is really simple, being built on top of this uh, Ethereum JS module. Um, the The total lines of code is you know 144, and and majority of this is boilerplate JavaScript. Um, one of the key things that I I did here was um, as so we initially initialize our private key. We make sure to identify ourselves as a uh, Ethereum JS dev P2P client. I put research in here to be a good actor in here. If people want to filter us out, they can. Um, and, and just reporting simple capabilities, ETH 63 and ETH 62, and then start starting to connect to the network. So as we connect to the network, we send out our um, RLP message, or sorry, RLPX uh, protocol message of the hello message. And then as soon as that comes back, uh, like I mentioned, we do the GeoIP lookup. So um, there's an embedded GeoIP database to quickly get the uh, location information on that IP. And then we enrich this data packet, um, do some additional um, splitting of information so that we can index on things like um, client name, client version, operating system name, et cetera, and then store that into the database. So. If anybody wants to try hacking on this, it, it should not be daunting. I'm not a um, JavaScript developer uh, 
regularly. I, I mostly work in Python, and, but you know, working in this was extremely easy. So if somebody wanted to take this and extend it, uh, I hope it's uh, pretty easy to understand where, where to get started. Um, additionally, in here, to make it easy to start uh, running, uh, I threw in a Docker Compose file so that you can just uh, do a Docker Compose up and you get three things. You're going to get this application along with the Postgres database and um, an application called Metabase. So uh, I wanted to put this data in a way, into something simple like Postgres and then find a tool that would allow people to build better uh, visualizations than I could build myself, uh, but without having to code them from scratch. And, and tools like Metabase are, are things that allow people to do that because ultimately the data is more important than the, the initial visual, visualizations. And so uh, I'll show you some examples that I was able to build, but I'm sure people can build better ones. Um, so so this, is, this is the package. Um, I'm going to... Oh, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and open source this right at, or unlock it and make it a public repo right after this call. Um, this is an example of the data. So uh, me being me, I, I messed up my actual live production data set right before the demo. So this is a snapshot of information from uh, a couple of weeks ago. But it, it looks you know, a little bit better than the, the data that's on, on Ether. Ether nodes, Ether scan actually started um, showing some of this data as well, but um, it's not something that you can run yourself. And, and in this ecosystem, I think we, we all like having something that we can run ourselves. Um, ah, yeah, time's up. All right. So uh, th these are the visualizations. Just really quick, I just want to show you uh, the peering table so that this is what's great about this Metabase tool is you can really drill into this and, and search for specific IP addresses, block numbers, hashes, um, and, and get a better sense of the, the information. So, uh, so that's it. I um, want to say thanks again for, for having me and everybody else enjoy GorleyCon. Um, just hit me up on Twitter or anything if, if anybody has any questions or uh, wants to collaborate in the future. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you.